left too. Mr. Blair, you're writing down two notes of things you learned today, okay? You don't, you don't, you don't have to, it's okay.
We'll just wait. Is that cool? Back. I need honey money, my wife. You said fifteen minutes?
Good morning. Good morning. So we're going to get started right now. And I hope everyone's on the silence right now. So now I'm going to have Mr. Tapper and if he can lead us in our free. Good morning, my name is Mr. Tower. Uh, please stand for the creed. Yes, sir! <laughs> I promise to give my very best. Over a way that with 
tears have been watered, and we have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughter. Out from the gloomy past, till now we stand at last, where the white God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, Thou who has brought us thus far on the way, Thou who has Keep us forever in the path we bring. Let's our feet stray from the places our God where we met thee. And let's our hearts drunk with the wine of the world. We forget. Good morning, everyone. I'm Scholar Host Juan Lopez Garcia. Good morning, everyone. I'm Scholar Host Juan Lopez Garcia. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to the fifth annual celebration of Woodson Institute Lecture Series 2023. all the eminent speakers who are all native from the state of Kentucky, but from different walks of life, who has come here to share their knowledge and vast experience with the African-American struggle. The theme of this four-week lecture series is justice. What does it look like? Who does it look like? How do we achieve it? And what does it mean? You are able to watch this entire series on our own YouTube page at CGWATV. Now, I will introduce your SGA president, Scholar Jaden Dixon. Furthermore, he 
served as the college lead to the university for the $56 million law building, rebuilding, expansion project. Danny also oversees efforts to engage the college with the university, the community at large, the commonwealth across the nation. Danny currently serves as a chair for the board of directors for the Partners of Rural Impact Incorporated, chair for the board of directors for Community Action Council for the Lexington Fayette, Bourbon, Harrison, and Nicholas Counties, chair elect for the board of directors for Junior Achievement of the Bluegrass Board of Directors and Executive Board Member, Vice Chair of Communications for Commerce Lexington Incorporated. Danny is a past chair of Commerce Lexington Incorporated Board of Directors where he also held positions of Vice Chair for the Public Policy Council for the Community and Minority Business Development Committee. Danny is also an associate minister at Consolidated Baptist Church here in Lexington, Kentucky. Danny is a native of Lawrenceburg, Kentucky. He obtained his bachelor's degree in political science from the University of Kentucky in 1993, making him his first college graduate in his family, and his Juris Doctor in 1998 from the University of Kentucky, Rosenberg College of Law. Ladies and gentlemen, the Dr. Daniel Patrick Murphy Jr. How are you all today? Good. All right. You all forgive me that I don't have my jacket on today. Is that okay? Uh, normally, I wouldn't do this. I have come off a crazy, crazy week, but it was just really exciting to receive the invitation today to be able to come and speak to speak with you all. Thank you, Mr. Dixon, for the invitation. Mr. Miles, where did you go? There you are. What a rendition there on a black national anthem. Let's give him... So you heard some of my background, and today is very, first of all, I wish you all could see what I see today. Looking out in this audience, seeing you scholars, seeing the educators that are around you today and committed to your success, this is something that people, as you're going to learn throughout this month, you're going to learn about people in our history, they literally sacrificed their lives for us to be able to see this vision today that we see in you. People that you learn about that did not get the opportunities that you do, that you're getting today, including myself. So this is a lot of fruit. This is a lot of labor. This is a lot of fighting that has taken place in our country, in our history, for you to be able to have this privilege and opportunity that you had the day and before you. So I hope that you all embrace that and that you not take it very lightly. You heard in my background that I am a lawyer by trade, uh, meaning that I still have my law license. I practiced for over 12 years actively. And then in 2010, I had a chance to come to the University of Kentucky in my current role, which they told you about. I help run day-to-day -day operations of the law school. I do our community relations work. Uh, but there's a lot of different things that you can do with the law degree. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how I got there. I didn't come today with just a sequence of remarks. I've been thinking about it for over a month of what I wanted to share with you. And in this short time, if you all will walk with me, it will be like flipping through some books in my chapter of life. And so I may hit one thing and flip a few pages to share some different things with you today. I will tell you that in this job, I said it's been a crazy week, I have the privilege of coordinating visits with our law students with some pretty prestigious people that come in from around the country. Uh, most importantly, I get a chance to bring in a lot of federal judges. That may not mean a lot to you, but our federal judges in that court system, they're appointed by the president. They have to be confirmed by our United States Senate. And those are lifetime positions in those judge roles. And they affect every law and policy that we live under in the highest land, uh, all the way up into including the United States Supreme Court. And so in my time at UK, including last week, I've had this privilege of hosting some high-level guests. Uh, I, in, my five, in my 13 years at the law school, I've had five United States Supreme Court justices that I get to host, 
take them around town for a couple of days. I've had Clarence Thomas, Samuel Alito, Elena Kagan, Chief Justice Roberts, and, and, and Justice Gorsuch, Neil Gorsuch. And then a couple of years ago, I had Eric Holder, former United States Attorney General. Well, this past Friday and Saturday, and I'm, I'm blaming it for why I'm casual, this past Friday and Saturday, I had a chance to hold the Federal Chief Judge of the D.C., Washington, D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. And he came in and spent two days with us, talking to our students, talking with our faculty, and then his biggest highlight was we took him to the UK-Kansas game on Saturday night. And so it's been a very busy week, weekend and long weekend, but this was too important for me to be here today. Um, and so a lot of privilege, a lot of things that you can do with that law degree. How did I end up then wanting to be a lawyer? I was 14 years old. 14 years old. Growing up in the small town of Lawrenceburg, Kentucky, about 30 miles from here. I can tell you that there are more people of color sitting in this section right here than may have been in my entire high school. My high school is about 800 people, and we were only about 3% African American or black. No Latino, maybe one or two Asian, and some other races. In almost every class that I was in that was an honor class or AP class or anything else, it was usually just me and maybe one other student of color. And so I didn't have that chance to look out here today and see people that look like me, bright scholars, bright opportunities. I was often seen in my high school, well respected, and in my middle school days, well liked, but I was seen as the exception as to what black people, African American people, and today brown people and other races can do. I didn't fit the stereotypes. I didn't fit all these other things that the majority community thought about me. I was more the exception, one who could do well. But I knew in my heart and my mind that we could all do well, we could all do our best if we were just given the opportunity to do so. 14 years old, I decided I wanted to be a lawyer. Why? Because in my hometown, I lived on the wrong side of the tracks. I lived in the lower economic end of town, where almost everybody black in my town lived. And a lot of things happened, the same thing we see today with the criminal justice system. When I was 14 years old, 10 of my friends in the neighborhood caught federal charges. Federal charges, not state crime. Why? Because a caboose on the railroad track that was beside our basketball court in our park in the neighborhood, uh, the train company had left that caboose there for about a week. And we had been playing on it. Lo and behold, one day, thank God I was out of town. Ms. Ross, I'd like to think I'd made the right decision if I was there. But some of my friends on that caboose one day when they were playing, they, they made a bad mistake. They decided they would start tearing up the caboose. They decided they would deface the caboose and take out the toilet and do some other things that they shouldn't have done in that caboose. Well, that, because that caboose was on train tracks in our country, that's federal property. And so 10 of my friends end up being charged with committing federal crime over a caboose. Now, almost all of them, except for the, were underage, so it ended up being a pretty light, stern warning, something that would be erased from their record. The two that are 18, they worked out a good deal. But I saw another guy that faced a more serious charge that ended up being one that led to someone's death, and it was tragic. And countless stories that go on and on that, as I was noticing, even at 14, with the caboose, with some of the more serious charges, etc., it just seemed like in my community, as we see today, that if you look like me, the charges were worse. If you look like me, you did more jail time. If you look like me, you had less of a chance of being forgiven and getting a second chance. And so I decided at 14 year old, years old, if I'm going to change this narrative, if I'm going to make a difference, how can I do so? And I think it can be through practicing law. So I set out at 14 deciding I was going to law school one day, 
thought I would practice criminal defense law because we needed more help in our justice system to make sure that people got fair representations. That if you did the crime, there would be consequences, but it needed to be fair. It shouldn't matter what your skin color looked like. The charges needed to be It shouldn't matter uh, what your socioeconomic status is, poor or rich. Your sentences should be the same. And I thought as a criminal defense attorney that we needed better representation uh, to make sure we were getting a fair shot in the justice system that continues to have issues. So what did that mean for me? I'm first in my family to graduate from college. I had a couple of aunts and uncles that started college. None of them finished. So no one knew what it was like past high school, what it took to really finish college. And my dad, who's still at 73, he's a truck driver. Uh, my mom worked in a factory all of her life until she retired. My father uh, quit high school going into his senior year, so he didn't have a high school edu education. And then my mom finished high school but no college, and nobody in my family, as I just said. So I had to begin to make decisions on a lonely road of people who supported me, loved me, large family, but no one really knew what college would be like. And most importantly, because of my family and background, I knew I needed scholarship money. I wanted to go to UK. I'm a big UK fan. Anybody? Go there, Blue? Just a few. Oh, man. We've got work to do. So, big Kentucky fan. Football, basketball, everything. So I knew I always wanted to go to UK, but I knew I needed scholarship money. Um, I played football in high school. I'm sorry, I played football in middle school, played football through my freshman year of high school. I knew, I mean, I loved the game of football, but I knew, I just told you, I had to have scholarship money. And at that time, you all, I was going into my sophomore year, starting linebacker, a lot smaller than I am today, though, but I was 5'10 and 170 pounds. How many 5'10, 170 pound linebackers have you ever seen in the SEC? No. Nine. So football was not in my future at UK. Maybe in another school, maybe somewhere else. So at 14 years old, I went to my high school football coach and I said, I'm not playing football anymore. He called my uncle who was assistant coach my uncle, who was a police officer at that time in Lawrenceburg, came up to the school and said, nephew, what are you talking about? We've been doing this. He said, I'm going to law school one day. I need scholarship money, and it's not, and I want to go to UK. And unk, there's no way that I'm getting a scholarship to UK in football, at my height and without putting on a lot more weight. And uh, he says, I don't remember this, and he said, unk, I might even run for office one day. So I'm going to quit football and start focusing on everything, everything else that it takes to get to the UK. I didn't know it at the time, you all, but what I realized shortly thereafter is one thing I want to leave you with today, if you'll remember. Every decision must fit your vision. Some of you have heard me speak before. I often say that, and nothing's changed in my lifetime. And that's something I live by every day. Every decision must fit your vision. You all repeat that with me. Every decision, Every decision must, fit must fit your vision. Every decision, Every decision must, fit must fit your vision. Remember what I said. I wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted to go to the UK for college. Those are the two things, that I, and I needed scholarship money. So at 14 years old, I had to start making some tough choices where football was not going to be my future. Hardest decision I've ever made, even to this day. But what I ended up doing was getting very involved in clubs. What does it take then for me to earn a scholarship and what I needed to pay for UK? First, it had to be academics over everything. And so when I told you I was that one or two in the class, I had to realize if my friends, particularly from the neighborhood, were not willing to come and take these harder classes with me to prepare me for college, then I would be seeing them after school and on the weekends. I had to make the tough decision that, again, it may not be the most popular, but I had to be in the classes that best prepared me, not the classes necessarily where my friends would be, because it fit my vision. I had to give up football. 
And then I decided and found out there were opportunities to develop my leadership skills away from the sports field and other things. So I started getting involved in clubs in school. Uh, do they have the Y Club here where students go to KYA, Kuna, Mock State Legislative, Mock United Nations, any of those things? That's something we need to work on at Frederick Douglass. Uh, any administrators or teachers in the room. Uh, that club absolutely changed my life. It's at some of your other high schools here. Uh, if it's not, if it's here, we need to find a way to get the students involved. So I had a, an advisor, a faculty member, who came, a professor, I'm sorry, I'm in that college window. I had a teacher in high school, let me get back to high school, who came to me and said, you quit football, I know you need scholarship money, let's get you involved. You have some natural leadership ability, I just think you get in the right places, we can find that way to get the scholarship money. So I ended up in the Y Club, as we call it. And I started going to Frankfurt for these mock state legislative sessions where we, we sat on the Senate floor and the representative floor. And we had youth governors and youth attorney generals and you could run for any office. And what we did as young people, middle school through high school, what they did then and what they do now is our school would go in with ideas on what we think legislation needed to be passed. As youth, young people, ideas, and we go in and we debate that on the floor in the Capitol, and you're trying to get, the, get it passed in the House and the Senate, just like the real world works, and get it signed by the youth governor. And do you all know, you probably don't, since you don't know about this program, what the youth governor signs at KYA actually goes to committee? for the real legislators to assign. So my uncle was a police officer. One of the things that was important to me back in the 1980s was, I just showed my age, back in the 1980s was that tent was too dark on cars that made it safe for officers like my uncle to approach on a routine traffic stop. So it was young people in a couple schools that got together and started coming up with legislation in our youth conference to say, we should limit ten, so it's safe for people to be able, to, for police officers to be able to approach vehicles without worrying about if it's a deadly encounter. And that was signed by the youth governor. Goes on to the state, maybe takes 10, 20 years or so, but eventually now we have laws like that. Young people, much better examples. That's one I was personally involved in. Young people today, young people across this state are participating in these conferences and coming up with ideas that our adult legislators are putting into place. So I'm big on the why. The why was big because, and I'm giving them a shout out today, the why was big because it gave me confidence. Again, maybe I was one of two occasionally in the committee. Out of a thousand people participating, maybe I was one of a hundred of color. But the one thing I loved about the why programs, and it continues today, when you go to these conferences, you have folks there, you have, you have students that are participating, and their, their moms and dads may be corporate CEOs or bank presidents, or their moms and dads may be truck drivers and come from the wrong side of the tracks like me, uh, according to, to where I grew up. But once we were in the same place, then it didn't matter anymore. We were all one. We all had a voice. We all had a vote. And it gave me a lot of confidence, as my grandfather tried to instill in me, that you belong everywhere. You are never too good to be in, in this place, and you are never not good enough, using a double negative, to be in this place. And that's one thing my grandfather instilled in me, is that I belong everywhere. And so that was something that became important in what the Y Club allowed for me. So shout out to the Y something I want you all to think about, and I'll be back to talk to Douglas a little bit more about that. So I also ended up getting involved in student council. You know, faith is very important to me, and so I did a lot of praying and other things about God. I need scholarship money. I need to figure out a way other than sports is not happening. And so right after the Y Club, I noticed in developing the leadership skills that I was in student council, in this school where there were less than that many of us out of 800 to 1,000 students, I ended up class president my sophomore year, junior year, senior year, ended up student body president, and ultimately 
ended up getting a full scholarship to pay for me to go to the University of Kentucky. Not only for undergrad, I ended up getting a full scholarship to go to law school as well. And so I went off and achieved that vision and that goal. But this is Black History Month. And we talk about the struggles. And we talk about the challenges. That road was never easy. And that road is sometimes not easy today. I faced some pretty tough circumstances in high school and in college. And I only share this because it's not a pity party, but it's things that I had to overcome to get to where I am today. Um, I remember, and I'll just maybe share a few of the stories. <laughs> I remember friends in high school, because remember, I'm going to these conferences, I'm in these clubs, I'm in these classes where people don't look like me. And so I remember friends that were sometimes threatened by their parents that getting too close to me or being in a relationship with me or other things, they might get disowned. I remember in college working for the state government, and I'll, I'll just flip the pages to some stories there. Um, I remember a lady coming up at one of my jobs, I'm a freshman sophomore in college, working in Frankfurt during the state, and the lady came up one day and she thought that her daughter liked me. And this lady worked for one of the higher ups in the cabinet, uh, cabinet for families and children. And so she came up one day and she threw a forearm in my chest to send me a message that her daughter, her daughter and I shouldn't even be friends. A lot of things that were happening uh, during that time. I remember, I told you I was student council president, uh, literally voted Mr. Anderson County. Um, uh, what you all don't know is through the WA Club, which I keep talking about, and uh, I, I did so well at that youth government conference that I received an award they only give out every now and then. So my name is on a plaque in the Capitol, up at the, by the, uh, the House, um, Legislative House Chambers. My name is on the plaque there. But because I keep coming back to what my parents did or who they were not, most wonderful people you will ever meet, because they didn't have political clout, because we came from not, uh, we didn't come from money. When I was applying for state jobs in the summertime, I didn't get the cushy cubicle office job to wear my khakis and my polo or my button down like some of my friends from high school and a lot of my friends that were in the Y Club programs came from the wrong side of the tracks. And so they put me on the moving curve. The moving crew, my guys to this day, men I look up to, it was all men. Uh, we moved, literally, we moved furniture around the state in diesel trucks. So if you go into state offices, I was with that crew in the summer pushing desks up and down the hills of eastern Kentucky sometimes. I was putting in new desks and file cabinets and working with a dolly. And these guys really showed me most of them didn't have more than a high school education. If they had a high school education at all, that was the most education they had. But these men taught me, like my family had been trying to teach me, the value of hard work and labor, and that you did everything with excellence. And that's the second point I want today to make with you today. First is every decision must fit your vision. Second is whatever you do, and whatever you get the opportunity to do, do it with excellence. And so these guys looked at me and they were like, you have no business on this crew. We don't know why they put you with us. We don't understand why you're not in this job with more cushy with a computer and a cubicle. But that was the path that God had for me at that time. And so I didn't become bitter about it. I didn't get upset about it. I knew that one day I was still going to be that lawyer and that would just be another thing I would have to fight and change. So when they handed me my dolly, I moved that furniture like them with perfection. I didn't touch a wall. I didn't dent one piece of furniture. I didn't scratch anything. We did everything with excellence. We did it all with perfection uh, on that job. But for three summers, three summers, you all, 
of my five that I worked in state government that kept bringing me back to the, to the moving crew. I was on Dean's List at UK my freshman year. Name on a plaque in the, in the Capitol. All these leadership accolades, but all they could see in me was another young black man that was just going to push the dolly and move the furniture. But I did it with excellence. Three summers. After the third summer, even the crew I was working with had had enough, and they started complaining around the building. And so the next summer, I come home from college, and I get a phone call, and they said, Danny, uh, we have a new summer job for you this year. You're going to work at the Capitol. And I thought, wait a minute. I've been over here in the cabinet for families and children moving furniture, and now I get to go to this Capitol that I spent a lot of time in high school with the Mar You all been to the Capitol before? How many of you been to the Capitol? We have a beautiful state Capitol, right? Marble staircases. Everything else is involved. I knew every office in the Capitol from my high school days. Uh, Secretary of State's office, Attorney General, Supreme Court Chambers. Uh, and you go through it. Everything with the governor's office. I didn't go in there in high school, but I knew where it was. So I thought, just hard work, persistence, all of these things that I go from the moving crew, and now I'll be in the Capitol building for a summer job. Is that all right? All right. Sounded good. And so I asked her, which office am I going to? I was pretty excited. Secretary of State, Attorney General. I've been talking about running for office one day. And she said, Danny, do you know the landscape up and down Capitol Avenue? I said, yes. I spent a lot of time on Capitol Avenue. She said, you'll be on the landscape crew this summer. One year from going to law school, Dean's List at UK. Three summers pushing furniture, and no matter what the accolades and what I was trying to do, I was still only good enough to work in the landscape of the Capitol. So I actually told that lady that uh, thank you, but no thank you. And it just so happened that a lady at my church heard about it, and she, she worked at the Capitol, and she went into the governor's office pretty upset. And so I got a phone call back a day later and said, actually, we have another position for you. And it was, at a, it was still at back at the cabinet. But this time, after three summers and everything I just mentioned to you, they put me in a cubicle so I could wear my polo, so I could wear my button down and wear my khaki uh, and what it takes. So the road is not always easy, is my point. But no matter the opportunities, you continue to do everything you do with excellence. And then the doors will still begin to open up to you if you have the faith that this is what God wants you to do. So I did. I got that cubicle job. And the same way I did with the furniture in the office, I did everything with excellence. And then the next summer, I had one more summer with them. They put me back in another office job. And again, everything I did, I did with excellence. Because my vision, I knew that everything I did had to fit my vision and what I ended up doing um, and going to law school. So again, got law school paid for, ended up going to law school, took my first job, let me flip, let me flip some pages here, took my first job in Paducah, Kentucky. When I go to Paducah, Kentucky, I was the only, anyone been to Paducah or from that area, far western part of the state? All right, I was the only, uh, I'll say only, there were four or five African-American black attorneys in Paducah, Kentucky. Uh, I was the only one that was in a firm and in private practice. And ended up joining a very prominent firm there in Paducah. I'm a partner in that firm, which is a big deal in, in the legal field to not only get the job, to end up becoming a part owner of the firm. But when I say only, understand that that didn't start that day. I only talk about high school being the only in class because when I look back, everything that was happening in my life was setting me up to be able to be successful and handle the situation and atmosphere later in my life. So I didn't mind being, I didn't like being the only. I want to open doors for more people to come in, but it, it didn't intimidate me. It didn't, it didn't cause me any fear to be considered the only 
out there in Paducah that was in private practice. It was opportunity for me uh, to be able to do so. And then to be able to open doors for other people. But I go back to sometimes you can't do what's popular and just be with your friends in order to get in those doors and what you're doing. And so I make partner in Paducah. I get married, bring my wife to Paducah. Uh, she was a lawyer there prosecuting, now a judge here. There were some other lawyers that came along the way. And let me flip back. I talk about state government and access and jobs and all of these things. So I wanted to be a lawyer, but I'd never been in a law firm, you all. Not in high school, not in college. Remember, I couldn't even get in the office of the state government, let alone a law firm. And so here's something I wanted to be, but something I had never experienced. And when I got into the law firm, that was really probably the second time in my life I'd ever had a chance to actually be in a true office, except for the ones that I also cleaned in high school and college. Uh, but here I am in this office, in this atmosphere, learning what it takes not just to be smart, but how to be part of this, uh, part of it, be part of this culture and be successful in what you're doing. And so one of the things I did in law practice, again, didn't mind being the only then, but had to start opening doors for others. So in my law firm, I used to make sure that other people who looked like me, anywhere close to me, if they wanted to be a lawyer, they could also come in to this law firm. They could come and shadow me. They could come and learn what it's about. They could come see what it took to be a lawyer. And I also mentioned that I came out of law school and wanted to do criminal defense. I ended up being in my first job. I'll tell that story. I got in my first job. The way that I thought we would change the community would be through criminal defense. Remember I said that? I wanted to do it through criminal defense because of the justice system and what was in play. You all, you start to figure out real quick there's all these different areas where you can make a difference. And in my first case at the law firm, I brought in a lady, uh, a, a mom, brought in a grandmother, and they had a grandson that was facing his second felony. Second felony. He had already been in trouble once. And I had a good partner in the firm that did criminal defense, and so we were taking the case. And the partner and I looked at the grandma and we looked at mom and we said, we can take this case, but we're going to need $5,000. $5,000. So when people think about criminal defense and you think about lawyers, how many of you know lawyers cost money? Right? And so here I am wanting to make a difference, make a change, go and be an advocate for this young man. He'd had one chance, but I really wanted to work hard for him to get a second chance. But mom and grandmother had to come up with $5,000. I knew from my family, we didn't have $5,000 anywhere. I don't know about yours. Grandmother went down to the bank, took out $5,000. She told me she had $6,000 she saved up in her life. She paid me, not me personally, she paid my firm $5,000 to represent that grandson. And we did. We got him a good deal to give him another chance in life. But her $5,000 was gone. Had that young man gone to trial or needed to go to trial, they would have had to pay us another $5,000. It's not that we didn't want to represent the grandson and take him all the way through the trial, but right? It's, I also have to pay my bills and feed my family, and so it's part business. But $5,000 we took, we were able to take care of that young man. The grandmother lost her life savings. Follow me on this, because some of you, how many of you may be thinking about law or politics one day? Anybody? A few of you. You see it on social media, you're going to be pushed, that everything's in the justice system and we need that help. Yes, we do. There are so many areas of law. If you want to change your community, you got to think bigger than the criminal justice system. $5,000, we did something good in the criminal justice system. But the next day, the partner that does business law in my law firm, in my old law firm, invited me in. And we had a man that was making about $200,000 a year in a business. And he found out that he needed to set up a company or a corporation. And that sounded like big to me. 
right? We're going to set up this corporation and we're going to do some good things to help this man in business. But if we charge that grandmother $5,000, I wonder how much my firm is going to charge this man to set up this company for the money that he's making. And $200,000 was a lot of money to me coming from that kid back in Lawrenceburg. Do you all know how much we charge that man to set up a corporation? How much? $2,500, you said right here. Anybody else? $100,000? Did I hear you? $2,000? Listen to me. Here it is right here. $800. is what that man paid us to set up a company. And this man was pulling in more than $200,000 a year at that time, $800. So they also said, Danny, you've been working in real estate law, which is ultimately what I ended up doing. And they allowed me at some point, once I passed the bar exam, they said, it's time for you to close your own deals. I've been doing all the lead work behind the scenes, but I start going into the bank and I'm closing my own deals. And so my first house that I closed on, I'll never forget, was a $150,000 home. Now I grew up in a little two bedroom, one bath, probably not worth $50,000 uh, today, but it was home, beautiful home for me growing up. Here I am closing on a $150,000 house. That was a big house, not in today's dollars and what we're seeing, but, but even then a $150,000 home was a really, really good home. So I was excited and I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm going into the bank, sitting in the conference room, I'm closing my first deal, you all, $150,000 home, just worked with a partner last week, $5,000 on a criminal case, $800 on setting up a company, and now I get to close my first deal, $150,000 house. The, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, the legal fees for buying you a home, what will you pay the lawyer, not $5,000, $425. That's all they paid us to go and close a house. How many houses can you buy and purchase and pay my fees before you get to $5,000? How many companies can you start and create and pay your legal fees before you get to $5,000? I realized first very quickly in the law practice that if I wanted to make a difference in my community, we need people that look like you, all of you, out here, in the seat to make sure that when you're collecting legal fees in my profession, that we're collecting and we're doing the work that puts money back in people's pockets, that lifts people up. Do we need good criminal defense attorneys? Yes, we do. Do we need good prosecutors and judges? Yes, we do. But I'm imploring you today to think about these other areas of law where you can go out and make a difference to begin to build wealth and lift people up out of poverty and other things that you can do. What I can tell you is the criminal defense system, we know it's a bad system. We know it needs change, but we have to work hard and what I do is volunteer to keep people that look like you out of that system. You know, our grandparents, right, you heard it, uh, you, if you touch a hot stove, what's going to happen? get burned. If you touch the criminal justice system on the wrong side, you're going to get burned. We spend so much time trying to figure out how do we turn down the heat on the criminal justice system or how do we make the heat, heat fair no matter what the color of your skin is or socioeconomic status. We don't spend enough time saying let's keep our people out of the system, even to start with makes a big difference there. So I'm looking forward to some lawyers doing some other sides. So every decision must fit your vision. Everything that you do must be with excellence. Those are the two main things that I want to leave you with today uh, in, the, in this discussion. But I want to take time for questions. I've got more, but can I pause here and take time for questions? Question. Yes.
So the question is, where was I when my friends were tearing up the caboose? Uh, he said defacing the caboose, he used my word. Where was I? Now, what you all don't know, quick background, I've known Sister Ross, Miss Ross, since I was a young teenager. Not only did I get involved, I left out that I was very involved in church and the youth conventions, and uh, Miss Ross Atkins was also my youth advisor. And uh, so I'd like to thank, you all know Miss Ross, I'd like to think that I had her in my head, and I would not have gotten on that caboose that I, the thought of my mom's belt back then, because that's what we did, would have kept me off of that caboose. Uh, where was I, young man? Thank God I was out of town that day, is where I was. Uh, and so therefore, I wasn't even put in a position to make that choice. You ask me what was going through my friend's heads, I don't know. That, that, that caboose had been there a week. Can't blame the train company and others. I really don't know. But what I can tell you is that I'm 52 years old today, and I still use that term, every decision must fit your vision. You're going to be faced daily with decisions, and you have to think about, is this the right choice or the wrong choice for what I want to do in life? Daily. And so that day, they made a bad choice, and there were some consequences. Thankfully, all of them ended up getting a second chance. Question, Like, where are the people that were doing that to the property? Like, where are they at today? Oh, the people that were doing that to the property were a little bit everywhere. Um, most of them are still back in Lawrenceburg. They never, they never stayed with me in taking the classes we needed to to get out and to be able to go to college. One of them is doing very well, though, in uh, agriculture. So he works. He actually works for the city of Lexington, but he has his own farm. Um, he raises some tobacco. He's an African-American guy, has some cattle and some other things. He works on it. He collects really nice cars. Um, and so he's doing, he's doing very well. Another one uh, is doing very well in a, in a factory job back at home. And then uh, four of the others. I know that all ended up in jail later on on other things, made their mistakes along the way, and so they're not really, not really doing anything. Go ahead. So I was going to ask you, what was the reason for the cabooses? Thank you. You know, that, this is a generational thing, you're right. I don't know if they even have cabooses anymore on the train. You all know the red car that was at the very end? Yeah. You said, oh, okay, the caboose is the red car that let you know that was the end of the train. A lot of times they put a light back there now. It also had restrooms, a little sink and kitchen area, so that's where you could go to relax for the workers out there. That's a good one. I don't know, that's a good question. Very good. Do the people in your advanced classes have a positive impact on you? Yes, they did. Um, that's a very good question. The people in my band's classes, although it was only two or three that may look like me, um, what I quickly realized, even in high school, is your friendship circles, and I, and I encourage you, they should be very diverse. Now, back home in Lawrenceburg at that time, it was black and white. We didn't have other races in my hometown then. We do now. But your friendship circles, those the same people I talk about, the same racism, and I only told one or two stories, I could tell you many more. A lot of times, though, these were the same people, my friends who were white, uh, were the same ones that were standing up for me. They were the same ones taking up for me. They're the same ones to today that are in very good positions as lawyers, some working for Hewlett Packard. Uh, one of my good friends just stepped down as VP of Operations for Tesla, etc. They're in positions today where they get a chance to make a difference as well. And so they were great influences for me. Their parents were good influences for me. They helped me in figuring out college, things that my parents just didn't know, my grandparents and family. And so, yeah, they're today what we call allies. A lot of those same people were helping me along the way um, as I was also applying to college. Did you have a certain teacher that inspired you to be what you were? Very good question. I had a few, had a few good teachers along the way. The ones that stand out, Miss Sutherland in math, 
I knew I wanted to go into government, history, more things like that, but she had a commitment to us and she was tough. She was a tough teacher, but she probably had the biggest influence when I go back to doing it with excellence. That from middle school and then I had her again in high school, Miss Sutherland demanded excellence from all of her students. I remember one time I left my, I lost my syllabus for class and she made me stand in one square block during class. I don't think you can get bothered with that today, teachers. I don't know, but I had to stand for a week in one square block in class till I came up, and she wouldn't let me just go and copy another student. Um, it just so happened the student moved away, so I ended up with one and got out of that block, but I never forgot that moment, and she demanded excellence. And then the other gentleman who was not my teacher, uh, but was in my school, was my faculty, but was my teacher advisor for the club. He's the one that taught me into getting involved in the Y Club that I keep talking about. Probably was the biggest influence in the back here. How much more time do I have on questions? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Something that I saw that made me want to change? That's a very good question. So I actually, I wasn't thinking about it at the time, but I heard in BMW, how, how many of you participated in BMW? It was either Miss Akins or one of the speakers that they brought in a few years ago, quite a few years ago in BMW, and I was at a session. And, and I remember something that captured the to answer the, to your question there. And they said, eagles don't fly with chickens. Eagles don't fly with chickens. And there's a story, you all heard that story before? Some of you have, some of you haven't. I'll, I'll tell the story and I'll tell it how I remember it. So some eagles were soaring overhead one day and they looked down, there, there were some chickens on the ground inside of the, just a fence that's only so high because you don't need a real high fence for chickens. And the eagle soaring over saw a baby eagle, a small eagle down there with the chickens. And so they flew down, started talking to the baby eagle and said, hey, why don't you come on and fly with us? You're clearly lost. And that baby eagle said, but I can't get above that fence. I can't fly above that fence. You see, the point of the story is the chickens have wings, but they don't really know how to fly. That baby eagle was meant to soar. And the eagle, the baby eagle, because he had been around chickens, didn't realize that his wings allowed him to get above that fence and soar, even though that's what he was meant to do. So it took those other eagles to come in, long story short, and get that eagle out and teach him that, no, you were born and meant to soar and fly at the highest height. But when you're around chickens, you don't know what your pure talent and ability is. And so some of the decisions I had to make along the way, people that I still call friends to this day, and not to put them down, but their vision, they weren't chickens, but their visions were the mentality of chickens. We all were born with wings and abilities. We we're all eagles, meant to soar. But if you get in a mentality that you can't even get above that little fence, then you'll be stuck there in the coop for life. Did I tell it right, Miss Aiken? You did good. Uh, okay. So probably the biggest thing is recognizing who you're around, who your friends are, who your circle is, and what that is doing. And sometimes those decisions are hard because people that I call my friends are not necessarily the people that I need around me to achieve my plans and goals in life. As you stated before, at times you would have been a black man or a person of color in your environment. Um, could you describe like the treatment and the experiences you had or describe any microaggressions that you dealt with? Uh, so you all heard the question. Um, yeah, let me, let me catch a, a, a couple here on that in terms of microaggressions and treatment. For every story that I tell you that had a negative, I'll tell you there are a lot more that I also had positives. Understand that here, I keep sound like I'm bragging, I'm not, but because I was willing to be that only one in the room and, and some other things, I ended up very involved here in Commerce Lexington, which is our Chamber of Commerce. And I ended up not only being on the board, but also the chair of the board of directors. 
did the same thing in Paducah um, and was blessed to be able to get involved. But along the way, there are some challenges in which you're involved in. So many that I need to start writing them down. Um, microaggressions and other things that may take place. Um, just in my law practice, I remember one time we had a key witness and the witness didn't know on the phone that I was a black attorney and I needed this witness for trial. And I remember him uh, on the phone talking, he kept using the N-word on, on, on the phone. And I had to make a decision at that point, uh, do I jump on him today or do I get him to court and let him be surprised at what I look like, get his testimony to win the case, and then we can have that conversation. And so, dealt with that. I had, a, uh, I, when I was in Paducah, um, I had a jailer. I was dressed up in my, like I would normally be in court. I may or may not have been today, if it wasn't for the crazy last week. But I'm in my, one of my best suits, and in a criminal defense case, uh, the partner, uh, the did criminal offense asked me to take over a client we had, African American uh, young man. He had on a fleece. I don't know if I'm describing that right, but he had on an athletic suit. Uh, like, tell me. Nike Tech is what they call it now. All right, showing my age again. Nike Tech suit. He had on a gold chain. He had on some gold rim glasses. Good guy. But I took him over to the jail in Paducah. Uh, we had set up a deal where we were just going to check him in, take him over and pay a fine, and then they would release him. So I'm in my suit, taking him over to court, sheriff's office, taking him to jail to just make sure I get him right back out. He comes in his Nike Tech suit, suit and we're standing there, and the jailer, the deputy jailer, number two guy, he looks at us and says, I have paperwork for both of you, but tell me, who's the attorney and who's the client? I was in Kroger about a month ago here in Lexington. My wife and I told you she's a judge now. I'm in my suit. She's in her work clothes. And we go into Kroger, one of the Krogers here in Lexington, and one of the older ladies working in Kroger ran up, and she's like, I just want to say hello, and let me guess, pastor and first lady. So, 2022 to 2023, there's things we're still dealing with that people don't see us being able to accomplish some of the things we do. We walked away, I came back, and I said, actually, ma'am, I'm a lawyer. She was like, oh my God, I feel terrible. I didn't tell her we were both in the ministry. It only happened, I said, I'm a lawyer. She was like, I feel terrible. And I said, well, my wife's a judge. My wife went back to Kroger, that was a month or two ago. She went back to Kroger, nothing against Kroger, just happened to be the place. And the guy, the, the guy at the meat counter, she was picking up some salmon. She said, can you have them weigh that uh, for me? So if I weigh it, I have to charge you for all of the salmon that's in there. And she said, okay. He said, uh, but it's $10 a pound right now. She said, okay. He's like, but that's gonna cost you $30. She said, okay. <laughs> so can you just weigh the salmon and I'll buy it? She goes up to the counter uh, to check out and the guys there said, Wow, you really, really look nice today. What did you have special? She said, I just went to work. Some of the things we still deal with on the microaggressions and the others is, remember, I go back to high school. Because of what I did, I was seen as the exception to what we can do as black and brown people. I was not seen that it was possible and capable for everybody to do it. And I got to say this, though. It's not just them. It's not just white people who sometimes do that, we do that to ourselves, That's right. right? I was treated sometimes as the exception in my own community because I was willing to reach out and sometimes be the only one. Quick story on that, I was in Illinois across from Paducah in a library in a school, Cairo, Illinois, that looks like this. And we were in the library and there was a sports magazine, guess who was on the front? Almost all black people on the front. There was a science magazine with engineers and others on the front. What do you think they look like? There was a National Geographic magazine with an astronaut in space on a spacewalk, fully covered, fully clothed, 
you couldn't see the race, you couldn't see the gender of that athlete. And I asked students who look like you, tell me if that the color of that, of that astronaut. Most people said white. And, if I, and I asked them, listen to me, that's good, that's good. And I said, man or woman? They said man. Because sometimes they couldn't even envision that this astronaut, astronaut could have been a black, a Latino man or woman walking in space. And sometimes we limit ourselves by our own vision as well. And so we have to get out of the mentality. We can be anything we want to be. And that's why even in Carter G, even with my sons, even with my nephews back here, you can say you want to play sports in college, and maybe you have the talent and ability to take you in a way that I did not, at least to go to the UK, but you better have that backup plan in what you want to do. It's bigger than sports. You can be anything you want to be. You can be the bank president. You can be the bank president. You can be the company CEO. You can open your own business. You can do anything you want to be because too many people have made the sacrifices today. Too many adults around this room are pouring into you today so that you can be everything you want to be. The question is, what do you do with it? Thank you. Is that for time purposes? Do I need to wrap up? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, how much money does it cost? Law school is expensive. Med school is expensive. Dental school is expensive. Average debt today can be eighty thousand to hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. To be able to go to law school. But again, again, starting now, that's where you got to have that vision and plan so you can start getting that scholarship money. For every dollar out there, there's an opportunity. Somebody wants to pay to see you be in those positions. Good people want to pay. Thank you. Thank you all again.